Good morning. It's good to see you here on this uh, little frigid morning, but thank you for being in the Lord's house. Hopefully it's warm enough for you here. And let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the day you have given us, Lord. We thank you for these good people, these faithful people who have come to uh, your service this morning. May we just have a blessing together as we open the word of God. Be with us, have us learn what you would have us to learn, Lord, and may we just enjoy the fellowship of one another in this church house. Uh, be with us and among us and guide us, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first song is number 82, Victory in Jesus. Number 82, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Hopefully that got us all in the mood. As Brother Kerry comes to the pulpit, our unison reading is in two parts, one verse from Mark and two from Matthew. Please stand if you're able and comfortable to stand as the Brother Kerry comes forward to lead us in this reading. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and his surname, them Bonergers, 
which is the sons of thunder. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Last week in both our lesson and sermon times, we began exploring stories revealing the interpersonal relationships that Jesus had with his disciples, and we'll continue with that same theme today. I mentioned last week during the sermon time that even though Jesus has 12 disciples, the Bible very well indicates that he has a close relationship, a closer relationship, I should say, with three of them. Over the years, Bible teachers have given this small group a name. It's called the Inner Circle. Jesus' inner circle consists of former fishermen Simon Peter and brothers James and John. As we read our Bibles, we find out that these three men are privy to some things that the other nine disciples are not. In fact, there are a couple times when the three men are sworn to secrecy from everyone else, including the other nine. After Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, Jesus instructs her parents and everyone else, including Peter, James, and John, not to tell anyone what they had, the miracle they had just witnessed. Another instance, after Peter, James, and John see Moses, Elijah, and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus instructs the inner circle to tell no man, to tell the vision to no man, including the other nine, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And let's not forget it's these three very same men, Peter, James, and John, who Jesus chooses to watch and pray with him at the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Unfortunately, those three fellows kept going to sleep, but that's another sermon. Of the three men, of course, James and John are close in. I mean, after all, they are brothers. But these two brothers shared no less than two careers together. That first, the first one being that of fishermen, and the second one being that of disciple of Christ. You know, it's one thing for brothers to go into the same line of work once, but to do it twice that's quite remarkable. It certainly reflects a closeness, a closeness between these two brothers. And although they're not blood brothers, the Bible indicates that there's also a closeness between John and Simon Peter as well. These two are the first of the disciples to discover Jesus' body missing from the tomb. Yeah, the women discovered it. Uh, the tomb was empty. But then these are the first disciples to discover it after the women. And before Jesus ascends into heaven, Peter shows more concern over John's future than he does his own. Now today's story is about a temporary disruption in the inner circle of three and even the outer circle of the remaining nine. The disciples' closeness is endangered by a woman. It's always a woman. But don't jump to conclusions. I'm not talking about someone's wife or girlfriend. There's no Yoko Ono here. I'm talking about someone's mother. There are three mothers who are mentioned from time to time following along with the disciples. First, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Of course, she would be there. Then briefly mentioned is another Mary, the mother of James the Less. And then there's Salome, or Salome, the mother of brothers James and John. Now, we aren't told in the Bible the ages of the disciples, but being that, the, that, some of the, that a few of their mothers are still keeping close tabs on their sons. Well, maybe these fellows are a little younger than what we envision them to be, at least a few of them. Anyway, James and John's mother, Salome, is a follower of Christ herself. She's not a bad woman. As I mentioned last week, Salome is among the other women who discovered Jesus' tomb to be empty early that first resurrection morning. James and John's father is a man named Zebedee, but instead of calling James and John the sons of Zebedee or the sons of Salome, Jesus nicknames these two as the sons of thunder. Now we aren't told exactly why, but it is fun to speculate. What is thunder? Well, we know thunder is noisy, but other than being unpleasant in the eardrum, thunder is really no threat to anyone. Perhaps nicknaming someone thunder means that person is loud, but essentially they're harmless. 
But as we also know, thunder is most times accompanied by lightning, which can be quite destructive. Maybe by nicknaming this person thunder, this indicates that danger often follows after them. But we also know that nicknames can be assigned ironically or sarcastically due to the person's opposite nature. For instance, a really big guy might be nicknamed Tiny, just as someone might call someone a pretty boy and they're not very pretty. But anyway, I'm just saying perhaps the nickname Thunder is assigned to someone who is introverted or backward, but I don't really think that's the, that's the uh, case here. The question remains, is Jesus' nickname, the Sons of Thunder, more of a reflection on James and John, or is it more of a reflection on their father Zebedee or their mother Salome? I think it's Salome, to be honest with you, what we're going to find out today. Salome may have been the one who earned her sons this nickname, and we do have some biblical evidence to support this hypothesis. The second half of our unison reading this morning tells a story that may put a little light on this Sons of Thunder stuff. Matthew 20, 20 tells us that one day Jesus is approached by James and John and their mother. The three have come to worship Jesus, but that's not their only objective, or at least it's not their mother's only objective. Salome wants to ask Jesus for a favor. Now, whether her sons put her up to this, put their mother up to this or not, or Salome is doing this all on her own, we are not told, but the fact that three of them come to worship Jesus, and Salome is the one assigned to speak. I can't help but think that their worship is a little, is a bit of a ruse. They might be using their worship as a chance to get closer to Jesus, you know, for their own purposes, but I'm not going to judge them. James and John's mother is bold to say the least, and maybe this is where they get the nickname Thunder. Anyway, we know Jesus is no fool. He can tell that this woman is not worshiping him solely out of admiration. Although he, I'm sure she does admire him, Salome wants something and Jesus cuts right to it. He says, what wilt thou? In modern language, it would be, what do you want? Just spill it. What gives? What can I do for you? In the past, I've made this statement several times. I still hold to it. Jesus never asks a question that he doesn't already have the answers to. You know, he needs... No heads up, he knows what this Salome wants, but he wants her to ask it aloud. Without hesitation, she gets right to the question at hand. She says, grant that these, my two sons, may sit the one on thy right hand, I had to think there for a minute, <laughs> the one on thy right hand and the other on my left in thy kingdom. Wow, that's quite a favor. When all is said and done and Jesus is back in heaven sitting on his throne, Salome wishes her sons, James and John, to be Jesus' bookends. She wants James to sit on one side and John on the other of Jesus as he's sitting on his throne. Now, please note, I do not believe this request has anything to do with the boy's desire to be in Jesus' presence. Nor do I believe that it has something to do with a seating arrangement. In asking this question, it is apparent that Salome wishes her sons to have some sort of authority in heaven. Again, this is quite a favor. Of all the men and all the women who have lived for the Lord and who have died for the Lord, Salome wants her son side by side access to the Son of God. You know, just from the top of my head, I can think of several other people from the Bible who would be more worthy of these positions, including Moses, Father Abraham, Elijah, King David, and even Jesus' own mother, Mary, and maybe even his earthly father, Joseph, should be the ones on those thrones. They would have more of a right to this. But I suppose this favor reveals itself not to be all bad. At least Salome allow, allows Jesus the center throne. You know, it, it would be quite blasphemous if she would say, now Jesus, you get off your throne and put my son there. Oh yeah, then that's a whole different sermon. But what prompts Mama to make such a request? I'm sure it's a mother's love of her sons and his desire to see them do well and succeed. Some mothers are blinded, if I may be so bold, by their love of their children that they don't see that there are others more worthy than their children for honor, but that's another sermon. But I can't help but wonder if the third member of the inner circle, Simon Peter, is unknowingly behind Salome's request. Salome has eyes, she has ears, she has most likely picked up on the fact that Simon Peter is the earthly 
heir apparent above all the other disciples for this Christianity thing after Jesus is gone. Maybe Salome is bothered by this. Why does Peter get to be the leader of the disciples after Jesus dies? Why not James or John? I don't know. God chooses who he chooses. And the, Jesus is the son of God. He's going to choose who he's going to choose. Maybe not wanting to dare second guess Jesus' decision of making Peter his earthly successor. Salome wants her sons to be Jesus' heavenly partners. In other words, she is creating positions of authority for her sons in the afterlife, since that role on earth is apparently going to Simon Peter. Unfortunately, no matter the motivation, Salome is just out of luck. Because we are told a handful of times in the Bible that the throne on the right is already reserved, it's already promised to Jesus Christ himself. Who has a center throne? Well, God the Father, of course. And we assume by this that God the Holy Spirit will sit on the left hand of the Father since they're the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one, but that's another sermon. In short, neither James nor John could possibly sit on Jesus' left hand because God the Father will be sitting there you know, with uh, Jesus on God the Father's right hand. So you see this request at the very least is ignorantly bold. At the very most, it's presumptuously arrogant. It implies that James and John are to reign in heaven alongside of God. Wow. Talk about overstepping yourself. So what is Jesus' reply to all this? As I read this, I don't see venom in Jesus' words. Just the reverse. He seems to be very patient to these people. He bypasses Mama, even though she's the one asking the question. And he addresses James and John directly. And he first tells, he first tells the two brothers, Ye know not what ye ask. And I think we can all agree with this. This request is made out of ignorance. They don't see the bigger picture. They don't see the implications of what they are asking. They are basically, without knowing it, I don't think they're saying this on purpose. They're saying we're, we want to be equal with God. No, 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 no. So Jesus asks the boys a question. He goes, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, I know it's hard to follow that. You need to read that for yourselves later on. But in other words, Jesus asks them, are you willing to do, the, to do the same as what I must do to make yourselves worthy of these seats of honor? Do you think you're worthy? Are you willing to do what I must do? And John and James naively answer, uh, yeah, we're able. We can do that. I don't believe they could possibly be grasping the question. Jesus isn't necessarily talking about drinking and being baptized. He's talking about them following his footsteps all the way to their deaths. Jesus replies, okay, okay, it's good that you think you are able, because that is exactly what's going to happen. Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. At this point, the two brothers seemingly think this is all some neat adventure. That being a disciple of Christ is all lollipops and sunshine. There may come rough times. There will come rough times ahead for these fellas. And they might very well wish they had never met Jesus. Yet alone joined up with him. It's not always going to be peaches and cream. But even though James and John are naive. Jesus seems glad that they think they are ready for what lies ahead for them. But Jesus has to let the air out of their balloon. He says... Uh, I'm sorry, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. Those seats are already taken. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of, of my Father. In other words, sorry guys, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but these seats are already filled. And that's it. That's the end of the discussion. Salome asks the question. Jesus addresses the brothers. I'm sorry, I can't do what you want. That's the end of it. Salome makes her request. Jesus nicely says no. Now, I wish I could say case closed and tell you that everyone puts this episode behind them. But this heavenly request of the sons of thunder has earthly repercussions. The Bible tells us, and when the ten, that's the ten other disciples, heard of this, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Now, I would hope that Salome, the mother of the sons of thunder, had the good sense to make this request of Jesus in private, but unfortunately somebody overheard it. There's some sort of, someone's in earshot. Maybe the whole crowd 
You know, she, we know she's a bold woman. Maybe she recklessly made this request in front of everybody. Somehow, word of this conversation gets out and the other ten disciples soon know of it and it causes a rift in the twelve. There's the ten against the two. The ten against the sons of thunder. You can hear the back talk in your minds. You've all been there. Somebody at work gets promoted ahead of you. And they did less than you and you know, you've all been there. Or you, you know. You can hear these other ten saying, wow, well, they got a backbone on them, don't they? Who do they think they are? They're no better than the rest of us. They don't work any harder than the rest of us. And they get their mommy to go speak up to them. That just shows how immature and unworthy they are to, have, to think they have authority over us in heaven. And the Bible makes it quite sure to mention the number 10. All 10 remaining disciples are displeased with James and John. 10. That would include their good friend and third member of the inner circle, Simon Peter. Now, Jesus can't have his men at odds with one another. They have bigger fish to fry. They have more important things to do, like preaching the gospel. So Jesus calls a staff meeting between he and his 12 men. This is literally a come to Jesus meeting. Jesus does the talking. All the men keep quiet. All the moms keep quiet. And Jesus tells them that the kingdom to come is not like the kingdoms here on earth. Salome, the sons of thunder, the other ten disciples, everyone, they all have it the wrong way around. The kingdom of heaven works in reverse to the kingdoms on earth. And you know how it is. How do you get to the top here on earth? You stab people in the back, you work harder, you, you, you throw people under the bus, you climb that ladder, and you get yourself to the top, and then people recognize that, and they give you authority, right? That's not how it works in heaven. In heaven, it's just the opposite. Those who consider themselves lowly, those who minister, the servants are the greatest in heaven. The Bible says they're their chief in heaven. Those who serve others are chief among the rest. If they want to be great, Jesus says, if you want to be great in the Lord's eyes, then you need to be lowly. Jesus then ends his lecture with a duh moment. He says, hey guys, look at me. I am the son of man. I am the son of God. I am the Lord incarnate. But you see me ruling and reigning on this earth? I got dirty feet and sandals walking along in the hot desert, uh, the hot trails. You know, I don't have a scepter and a crown on my hand. Do you see a throne behind me? No. I came to this earth to minister to others. I came to this earth to give up my life for others. I am here to die for those who are more lowly than, every, than, than myself, which would include everyone. If you want to be great, follow my example, and that is our lesson today. If we want to be great, then we are to be more like Jesus.
responsive reading. I forgot what it was called there for a second. Our responsive reading are four questions asked by four different disciples to Jesus right before he is to go to the cross. I'm going to invite Brother Bob Burke to the pulpit to lead us in this responsive reading. These are four disciples that have asked Jesus four different questions. Please stand if you're able, able and comfortable to stand. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Philip saith unto him, Show us the Father. And it suffices us. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself into us? and not unto the world. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to revisit the night before Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Jesus and his 12 men are meeting in a place called the Upper Room, sharing in their Passover meal. The Passover was a commemoration of the Israelites' delivery from their Egyptian enslavement some 1400 years prior. During their time together, Jesus washes the feet of his men despite the hesitation of Simon Peter. Judas Iscariot is dismissed to put the final touches on Jesus' betrayal. And Jesus turns the bread and the drink from the Passover meal into the very first communion service that we call the Last Supper. His crucifixion is just mere hours away, and it will come as no surprise to Jesus Christ. He always knew this day was approaching. This, he always knew this day would be coming his entire life. I think at one point Jesus probably said, well, I got six years until I'm crucified, and then I have three years until I'm crucified. Now I got four months, now I have four weeks, and now I have four hours. His crucifixion is just mere hours away, and knowing this, will be the last chance he has for a quiet moment with his men, the men with whom he shared the last three years with. Jesus shares with them the most beautiful of words. But this speech is more than just a tender farewell. Jesus, is, who is the answer to all their questions, is giving his men the answers to all their questions. I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least one line from this beautiful passage, arguably the most famous of the, of the lines are, let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus' entire speech can be found on, in John 13 and 14. Please study that out for yourself sometime soon. Among other things in his speech, Jesus alerts his men that he will soon be leaving them, but he promises them, them that they'll be together again one day. He promises that he will build mansions in heaven for his disciples and all who else who else will believe in him? He also promises to send the Holy Spirit to comfort them in their time of separation. During his beautiful speech, Jesus is interrupted four times by four different disciples. Since we've been exploring Jesus' personal relationships with his disciples, I thought this would be a good use of our time this morning to review these four questions and then to give Jesus' answers to these four questions. There's nothing really to extensive in my sermon today. I'm going to repeat the four questions we just read in our responsive reading, and I'm going to give you Jesus' four answers. Speaking of his upcoming death, his burial, and his resurrection, Jesus tells the 11 remaining men, because Judas has been, Judas Iscariot has been dismissed, he says, whether I go ye know, I'm sorry, whether I go ye cannot come. In other words, Jesus is saying, where I'm going, you can't come along with me. And hearing this, Simon Peter is the first to interrupt Jesus' parting words, Peter asks, Lord, whither thou goest? Now, where are you going? Jesus answers, Whither I go, thou cannot not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Jesus promises Peter and the others, You cannot go where I'm going today, but yet, you can't go yet, but one day you will follow after me. This brings us to a response of reading. Peter said unto him, Lord, why canst not I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. I wonder if Jesus got a little chuckle out of Peter's enthusiasm. Because Jesus responds, oh, really, Peter? Well, such brave words. 
Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. In other words, you're going to deny, you know, you're not going to die for me. You're not even going to say you know me. You're going to deny me three times before the next morning. No doubt Peter is shaken by Jesus' comment. He's probably insulted by it. But the proof is in the pudding. Jesus knew what he was talking about. Peter denies Jesus three times, just as the Lord foretells. Moving on. Jesus promises that he is not forsaking his men. He promises, and whether I go, ye know, and the way you know. In other words, you know where I'm going. I don't have to tell you. And you know how to get there. Jesus is going home to his father, and we get there. We get there with him by trusting in him as our Savior. Well, the disciple Thomas totally misses what Jesus is saying. Thomas is thinking Jesus is talking about some sort of road trip to a physical place like the temple or the Jordan River or the wilderness. Old doubting Thomas interrupts Jesus and points out, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. If we don't know where you're going, how can we know how to get there? How can we know the way? Jesus famously answers Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the, the, truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, I am going to the Father, and I am the only way to get there. In fact, there's no other way to get there but through me. To further answer Thomas's question, Jesus states, If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. This statement is meant by the third interruption to Jesus' speech, only this time it's Philip who speaks up. Philip saith unto him, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. In other words, you keep mentioning the Father. Well, we don't see him. Make him appear before us, and then we will know who you're talking about. I think Philip's request shows that Philip has missed everything that's going on around him. And most likely, he's missed everything in the last three years with Jesus. I'm not sure if the Son of God rolled his eyes or not. But I know if the Son of God could get befuddled, this would be the time. Jesus responds to Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He's saying, Philip, you kind of missed this. You have been with me for three years. In that time, you have seen me heal the blind and cast out demons. You have seen me feed thousands of people with very little food. You've seen me calm the storm and walk on the water, no less. Besides all that, Philip, you have heard me with your own ears more than once say that I and the Father are one. Philip, he says, he that have seen me has seen the Father. How can you ask, show us the Father? After all this time, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Please, Philip, believe me that I am in the Father. I often wonder later, Philip is saying, boy, that was a dumb question. You know, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, that comes close. Anyway, moving on. Jesus goes on to say, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself in him. Now you can read that on your own. I know listening is it's easier to it's more to it's better to understand it if you can see the words. But in other words, Jesus is saying, if a person loves me, if a person loves Jesus, not only will Jesus love that person back, God the Father will also love that person as well. And not only that. Jesus will show himself to such a person. He will make manifest himself to that person. This brings us to our fourth and final interruption in Jesus' speech. Hearing this, the other Judas, not Iscariot, he's gone. Sometimes this Judas is called Thaddeus or Labius. He speaks up. He said, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us? How will you show yourself unto us and not show yourself to the rest of the world? What is the determining factor? What will make some people see the Lord while others will not? And the answer is love and obedience. Jesus answers this other Judas, If a man love me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and, he will, and we will come unto him and make, him our, and make our abode with him. I'm sorry. He says, However, he that loveth, not, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. In short, if we want to see Christ, if we want him to manifest himself to us, if we want, if we want him to shine through us, we need only to love him and keep his word. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for these 
uh, questions of the disciples, even though they seem silly to us, but we've had 2,000 years to review them and study them. We have the benefit of hindsight to make these questions uh, more elementary than they probably were to your disciples. Lord, but we're so glad that they asked these questions so that we have these answers from your son to assure us of these biblical truths, these doctrines that we hold dear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and turn to page number 432, softly and tenderly, number 432. We'll sing one verse and be dismissed. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Patient and loving, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling a sinner, come home. Amen. And let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, as we leave this place, may, you see, may we feel your hand upon us. May you keep us safe, Lord, until we meet again. And whatever you have for us this week, may you give us the tools to, to overcome it. May we, uh, or, and give us the blessings because we have you in our hearts, the peace that passes all understanding, Lord. Until we meet again, keep us safe and love us, Lord, and bless us on top of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.